Welcome back, everyone. Today I'm with Keith McManus, who has just returned from uh, U.S. News down in Washington after five years as picture editor down there. And uh, Keith, uh, it's glad to see you back at RIT. You've, you've been here before, uh, and uh, this is probably the third time you've been back teaching here. Uh, I think our students would like to uh, have a little bit of a history here. Uh, how did you end up? Uh, What's the, what's the path that you've taken to arrive at our doorstep today? Oh, again? Back to RIT. This is, my, my, I guess, my third time to RIT. I was fortunate enough to have been a student at RIT in the, in the 60s. And, um, and then I came back here uh, in 1989 to teach photojournalism. And I was here for four years. And uh, at that time, I left and joined the staff at US News in Washington. And, uh, and now I'm back as a... Uh, visiting professor for uh, the winter and spring quarter uh, of, of this year. But that's, you know, that's the, you know, the, 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 short, the, short, yeah, the short version of my history. There was a lot of other events in, in, interspersed in there. Uh, I guess the main thing was that, uh, is that photography has been the, uh, the main thread uh, through all of it. And uh, what I managed to do uh, during that course of time was to add, um, you know, uh, auxiliary skills and uh, and paths to using my photography uh, over that period of time. As technology changed, mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, it became apparent to me that uh, there were new things that in order to remain viable and just I think to increase the creative process that it was in, important to uh, embrace new technology. And uh, so I started actually with computers in 1980. I became interested in uh, computers and imaging. Now let's let's know, uh, the fairly date, early. let's put a date uh, let's say 1980 was an Apple IIe or a IBM PC so Oh, that original, was even before the PC. Like you know, the Sinclair. That was before the Mac. Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, I worked with Sinclair and uh, uh, Tandy and all mm -hmm. those things. Um, uh, my my initial experiences were with uh, Unix machines and and the like, and um, a, a, an operating system called the PIC operating system. Oh, I remember PIC. And it was, it was Xerox, Prime. wasn't well, it? Well, Prime, it was Prime Computer had it. Uh -huh. And uh, I still remember the first graphics program that I ever saw. And uh, it was, I think, cost $60,000. Mm -hmm. And ran on a computer that was, uh, at, I think the entry level was a quarter of a million dollars. And compared to what you can do now with a few thousand dollars in Photoshop, I mean, it just, it just pales. You know, in comparison, but it was exciting. I, I remember well, that first, uh, the first time I had exposure to a computer that did very, very primitive graphics. Yeah. I, I can't, I, I haven't had that kind of excitement uh, since. And it, it took a lot of faith because in at that time, um, uh, the path through using the computer to actually generating something uh, wasn't very well filled out, and it was very uh, you know rudimentary, and so you had to kind of stick with it for you know, a decade or so until it, it really, you know, became something that you could actually use. Mm -hmm. And um, even at that point, um, a lot of people in the business considered the, the idea of doing all this with a computer, you know, uh, pre-press or typesetting or things like that as a, a novelty. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, would go away. And, that, and of course, it didn't, <laughs> you know. And it's, so it's, you know, it's, it, it was that, you know, hanging in there. And, and the, uh, the other important thing was for me, was to uh, integrate it into my photography and what I was doing, that it wasn't something that was uh, something extra, and that I was interested in, in the ways that it could empower me right. um, as an image maker and a storyteller. Right. Now, I, I see uh, one of the, one of the uh, signs that you're in the area is when I see the, the uh, old Leica M3 yes. dangling from your shoulder, and I always know that it's you. Uh, you, you, you use a film camera, the classic film camera, yes. to, to capture images on film. Mm -hmm. when, was the f when was the first time you were able to take those images off of film and get them into a digital format? Well, um, I, th I guess it was um, probably when I was here teaching at RIT was the, the first real opportunity that I had to do it at any at any great length. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd had a, a before I came to RIT, I had a little bit of experience. I'd done some actual, not with traditional film, but early on, I'd done some uh, uh, imaging uh, with, using a video camera and a Macintosh mm -hmm. uh, to bring images in. But those were one bit images; those weren't full grayscale. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so it it was probably 
um, you know, I'd seen some scanners and I'd used them. But when I came to RIT, uh, at that time, Doug Ray had just started the, the digital photography mm -hmm. and uh, Photoshop had just come out. In fact, it, it was a beta version. It wasn't even available. And, so this uh, is late 80s, 87, well, well, 80, 88? Yeah, I had some in 80, in, in the, in the the late 80s, I sort of, the truth of it is I'd gotten away from uh, still photography for a while. Mm -hmm. um, video had entered my, uh, my life, and um, in 87, I, I co-produced and, uh, and, uh, and shot a documentary for PBS. Mm -hmm. That was my first venture into television. Mm -hmm. And that, um, it, that was like 14 months worth of shooting for the project. And uh, that really uh, diverted my attention from still photography uh, to video. Um, and so there was some developments in the, along the in still photography that I didn't really uh, engage until I came to RIT to teach uh, photojournalism. I see. And of course, then the, the facility was here, and um, I'm right, you know, kind of got into it right then. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, at, at that point we, you know, we were trying to incorporate it into the uh, into the curriculum. And you know, Kodak had their their digital cameras out, and those I remember using the, the first ones of those. Those were. The ones that had the, had the enormous external uh, uh, hard drive that you had the, to carry around the yeah, thirty-five pound thing, right? And, and you know, uh, you know all of that. And um, it all it, it, again, it takes. I think this technology, in, in many ways, takes great faith because certainly, you know, photographing with that camera uh, was not as elegant or as easy as using a Leica mm -hmm. with with Tri-X or Kodachrome or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, I mean, there, there is a certain novelty to all this, and it's, it's, it's a good thing, uh, because if there wasn't, I think it, people would have given up on it at some point a long time ago. Uh, but in, in, the, in these intervening years, all this has, you know, what, I guess the one important thing about this is that this technology advances incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, when, it, when we're, we're talking about my Leica and the, and the film I use in it, um, you know, really, in a, in a I'm making photographs very much the way I might have made uh, photographs at the turn of the century. Right. Uh, the, you know, there's you know, some advantages in quality of film and lenses, but essentially I'm doing the, exactly the same kind of chemistry in mm -hmm. the process. Uh, and that's not much of a, a technological change. And I, I think you could look at our whole you know, history in yeah, technological no matter, history. No matter how fancy the cameras get, you're still just, you just have a lens and uh, you open the lens and you let the light on the film and it's... Right. it's uh, all the electronics do is is maybe make the exposure uh, decisions for you or whatever. Yes, yes. And the, but with the electronic media, I mean that the way that's I mean, and not not just the capturing method, but the whole the whole process, you know, through to what you know, however you decide to publish your your image or your your text or whatever you, you're doing, um, has you know evolved incredibly fast mm -hmm. and has empowered people uh, way beyond I think people's expectations a decade ago. I don't think any most people were. You know, really thinking about you know what was going to happen. Uh, you think about industries that kind of disappeared. You know, like uh, all the paste up uh, stuff. You know, like waxing and stuff like that. And uh, all the remember the, uh, you, the copy graphic that you know, having your your typeset in film and things like that. Right. You know, that stuff just you know literally just disappeared overnight. Yeah. You know, when you think about the, uh, the the printing industry and how slow things changed until the last decade or so. Yeah. So it, it was. For me, that was all really exciting. Mm -hmm. You know how, um, and it, and again, like I said before, uh, for me, the, still the central issue was my photography, and and how I could use this technology. And then when I was teaching here, um, uh, that's what I, you know was trying to you know instruct students in the ways that they could use this technology, uh, and, but still have the main focus in content. Because mm -hmm. I think it's really easy when you have something that is novel as this uh, that you can sort of get overpowered by. All the little gizmos. It's sort of like what happened with desktop publishing mm -hmm. came out. You know, there was people were doing newsletters with 100 fonts on a single page. You know, like <laughs> yeah, I never saw anything quite that. <laughs> well, that was that's an overstatement. But it was you know that kind yeah. of that kind of thing. And, and, uh, and the, you know, like maybe we're getting a little bit further advanced here. But the, you see see the same thing in the web now. Mm -hmm. uh, the people just. Uh, uh, I mean, and I think I think that's a, also an interesting you know, con concept here about. Uh, it's about design and about tradition, yeah. and how you uh, you know take all those values and 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 bring those things forward into new technology, and because the new uh, those things are still valuable, yeah. and um, and then then how are they affected those traditions, uh, those values by new technology? You know, I think that's an interesting. 
thing seems, to consider. Yeah, it seems to me that the first thing you, you always try to do with technology is you try to do what you've always done with right. the old stuff. And then there's this period of discovery where you, you learn, uh, wow, I can do all these neat new things. We're going through this period uh, now in typography that some people have called grunge typography, where you know any, any, anything you want uh, by way of type is, is available to you. Uh, but then you know things settle down, and you come back to some kind of classic uh, uh, relationship to the new technology. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've all gone wild over certain things. I, I think I've I've certainly done it. I I never used a hundred typefaces, but uh, <laughs> I certainly probably used ten, <laughs> which is still breaking the rules. Um, so so the whole idea here is you know you use a film camera to to create an image or to secure an image or capture yeah. an image, and um, I know for example uh, if you go back to the time of uh, the Second World War uh, you had correspondence overseas uh, uh, and and they would produce an image on film and then they get the the, the image printed in the U S uh, they they literally have to fly the film across the ocean. And, uh, and and then and then go through the whole f engraving process and everything else, um, and so all this digital technology really makes sense when you're when you're trying to get images in front of people uh, very very quickly uh, mm -hmm. after they happen. So why don't we start? Why don't we talk a little bit about the news photography business? And um, well, in the last few years, uh, I don't most photojournalists I know, at least the kind of photojournalists that do news. Um, uh, the idea of, of uh, having a, a camera uh, in your in a bunch of lenses, uh, you know, was a, a, that's still you know part of their rep, their equipment repertoire. Right. But now they've added laptop computers and scanners and the like. And uh, uh, I don't know how many photographers have, that have called me over the last several years and say, well, what should I buy? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, I. I, I know I need this, uh, and they would, you know, they would call me at the, at the magazine and say, um, uh, you know, are you going to be taking, you know, transmissions? Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm doing a story somewhere, you know, what, will you do that? And then, and sure, you know, if if it's, if it's a deadline, mm -hmm. uh, that that's important. Because, I mean, this is this is important. I mean, like a news magazine, uh, we you couldn't compete with television, mm -hmm. uh, but the new technology did. Um, Offer an opportunity uh, to make the, the the weekly news magazine a more timely mm -hmm. object. I mean, that's one of the problems with the uh, weekly news magazine in the era of television is that it doesn't have legs a lot, a lot of right. times. Right. Because you can go through a, a week of of putting together a, a magazine, and uh, for instance, the case of, in my experience at U.S. News and World Report, um, we put the magazine to bed on Friday night. Mm -hmm. um, time. You know, did theirs on uh, over the weekend time of Newsweek, which I mean, gives a, a few extra you know hours or days right. to, uh, to something that was closing. But because of the of the uh, and, and the just production just process, um, you get kind of locked in. Like right. when you get down to Friday, um, you can make changes, uh, but it gets pretty expensive. Right. And part of that expense is you buy time on a press mm -hmm. and. And you, you you can't if you move it or uh, that costs money, uh, and, and a few times in the four years I was there that, that had that happened in that um, you know, even the press run had started mm -hmm. and they stopped and uh, you know and in several occasions we had actually produced two magazines. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, for instance, uh, when Nixon was ill and, and the week he died, uh, we had two magazines and two covers because we didn't know. Uh, what the 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 event final event might be right. by that Friday when we closed, right? And so it, you had to have a magazine if if he died before Friday mm -hmm. that reflected that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if he didn't die, then y your magazine wouldn't. Of course, right. he could have died over the weekend, and there would have been no recourse. Yeah, you couldn't. So that's one of the problems with that kind of technology is that you you it's it, it's 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 an interesting dilemma. Um, it's uh, unlike a newspaper, which every day a uh, daily newspaper they. They're out there, and you kind of forget what they did the day before. Right. It just kind of disappears. Well, they, they have the same dilemma, except it's on a, a more compressed scale. Right. Then you're talking about hours. Um, or if it's a big metropolitan daily, they may have editions right. where you know they could change the whole front page right. if something happens. Whereas a, a weekly news magazine. And I think the other thing too is you. Um, if, I think if you look at U.S. News, in a lot of cases, is that the cover is not 
um, a news cover. Mm -hmm. And that's one way around that, that problem in the, in, as far as news, uh, newsstand sales mm -hmm. are concerned. When you say not a news cover, you mean it's a feature cover? Yes, or right. And the, I mean, the magazine um, in particular has developed a, a style of con like consumer reporting. Mm -hmm. And they, they do guides uh, periodically. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are usually the best-selling covers. And the only times th those guide covers or uh, those kind of feature covers get replaced if there's really a major breaking news story. Mm -hmm. And then you would put that on the cover. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, uh, that wouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, just to backtrack a little, uh, you put the, the uh, you close the magazine on Friday. When does the magazine appear, let's say, in my mailbox or in the newsstand? Uh, Monday. So, so it's, it's actually, everything happens over the weekend, the printing yes. gets done, the distribution gets done. For instance, Friday night I could leave the magazine um, at 9, 9.30 at night, maybe 10 o'clock, depending on what was going on. And if I wanted to, I could come back in probably by late morning and mm -hmm. there would be a box of magazines uh, from the, the first run. Mm -hmm. They may not be absolutely color perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, but those were the first ones off the press, and they get shipped right back to us. And then the next, when they finally get the, everything running, you know, correctly on the presses, then those are the ones that would, you know, go out uh, the, the mail. And then I, I think, uh, I think the newsstand uh, depends on where they, where the newsstand was. Mm -hmm. There was two printing plants, and all that information goes by satellite to the, uh, from, uh, from uh, U.S. News. U.S. News, um, their pre-press company. Uh, is uh, Applied Graphics Technology, mm -hmm. AGT, which at one point was wholly owned by U.S. News. Mm -hmm. And their facility is in the basement of the magazine. Mm -hmm. And so that was very convenient, and then you could you know, you'd get your films back, you could do all this stuff electronically on a network inside the magazine. And then that would be sent uh, by high-speed modems to their satellite uplink uh, in so New Jersey, and then that would go to the printing plant. So that was basically, you know, you know, the type, you know, how the 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 data got right. from from the the magazine itself you know to the printing plant right. on Friday night. Keith, let's let's just review that workflow because I don't quite understand how exactly did the information get from the editorial offices out to the printing plants? Yes, um, when I first got to the magazine, they had fax machines, mm -hmm. and these were enormous high res fax yes, machines, and they faxed the uh, the data. Uh, to the satellite, mm -hmm. um, and then that was then trans translated, put up on the satellite, and would go back to the uh, the printing plant, and then the films would be made there. Mm -hmm. And there are two plants. There are two uh, plants, yes. To print the entire run, right? For, for about two point eight million issues. And, and where were those? Where was the editorial, and where were the plants? Um, one well, the editorial. Uh, the entire editorial production is in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. There is an office in New York City, mm -hmm. um, and there are a couple other bureaus. Uh, but And the printing plant, uh, they changed them recently. I'm not sure where they are now, but there was one in Tennessee, and I think there was one in New England. Uh, but I can't, I, you know, but they, they, they offered up, you know, contracts to new plants. And right. They, they, so that's, right. I can't be more specific about that right now. Um, so the, but the workflow was basically, you know, through the week. Um, the, the magazine actually, in many cases, some parts of it would start weeks in advance. Mm -hmm. You know, depending on where, what part of the magazine, mm -hmm. uh, the back part of the magazine, the, the culture and ideas section, the news you can use, and thing, those sections, uh, the back of the book projects uh, could be in development for quite some time, uh, just because they weren't news stories. Right. And uh, the front of the book, the U.S. News section, was the most volatile part of the magazine. And that part, it, it, it could expand or contract depending on what happened during that week. Mm -hmm. Stories could die, uh, something could get added. You know, that was the, the most difficult section to work on mm -hmm. for anyone because uh, there was never any guarantee that it was going to look uh, one way all through the week. Right. You know, some weeks you, maybe you were lucky, you know, and, and not much happened, you know. Um, for instance, like, when the Russian Revolution, and not the one in 1918, but the one that happened at... Uh, 91? Yes. Um, U.S. News um, has doesn't publish 52 uh, weeks a year. It mm -hmm. publishes 50 weeks. Mm -hmm. And it publishes what, two double issues. Mm -hmm. And what that allows for is it gives the staff a, a week off in the summer and the week off in the winter. Um, and the one in, the, in August, the, it's called Dead Week, 
um, everybody was gone. Uh -huh. And the Russians decided to have a revolution. <laughs> uh -huh. Of course, they published a magazine that week, uh, and, uh, but with a very small staff. Uh, of course, in some ways, that's where technology helps. Mm -hmm. Is that um, you know, it, it does empower you, you know, to do those kinds of things. Uh, um, it also raises expectations. Uh, people, you know, everything gets done a little faster, right. and so so people kind of expect, you know, like a story will be, uh, you know, in the lineup, and, and the art department, you know, wants the artwork. They want the photographs, you know, and maybe for some reason or other, they're a little slow coming in or something like that. You know, so there's a kind of, you know, everybody, you know, kind of wants to put these pieces together. Yeah. Uh, the thing I like about the, 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 the news magazine um, is that it's, it, it seems like the stories are a little, there's a little bit of time lag, and, and, and that's almost makes me feel more confident that the story has been thought about, yes. and there's, <clears throat> it's, not, it's not just right, you know, right off the press the way a newspaper is. Well, you, you're, you're right, and that I think that's, uh, I, 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 can, I can't speak directly about Time or Newsweek, uh, but that was the, the thing that was important at U.S. News was that uh, you did have an opportunity to, you know, to write something that was uh, somewhat more reflective and, and researched mm -hmm. uh, that you wouldn't have a chance to do it in, in a magazine, or excuse me, a newspaper. The other thing is, of course, the space in a magazine is, is very precious. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's an incredible craft. Uh, to be able to write a story in 700 or 800 lines. Mm -hmm. um, and the writers at, at the magazine um, are very good, mm -hmm. and very good at doing that. And uh, I always was Im impressed by how well structured the stories were and how much information was yeah. in there. Um, but people worked very hard to do that. Yes, this leads us to the other side of the business, which is advertising. In our uh, discussion with Owen Smith, um, he told us that in the typical newspaper, the mix of advertising to editorial, the ratio was something like 60 to 40 or as high as 75, 25. What kind of ad ratio uh, would be in a news magazine like U.S. News? Oh, well, I'm, that I couldn't tell you exactly, but U.S. News. Um, the U.S. News has a, uh, part of it is the, uh, the difference in the way ads are sold. Mm -hmm. um, U.S. News sells ads differently than uh, Time and Newsweek does. The way the magazine goes together um, it has to do with the spreads. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at U.S. News, uh, you'll, a lot of spreads will be uh, uh, busted sometimes by regionals, mm -hmm. regional advertising. And at, at the magazine, you, you would, uh, there was this large board uh, in the art department that had all the spreads, uh, proofs, uh, as the magazine came together during the week. Um, so each two-page spread yes all of them in the whole magazine were up there yes visible yes and as the week as the week went uh through the quality of the proofing in, improved in other words when the, as the week started off the, that board would have virtually nothing on it except mm -hmm. maybe a, a story that was in the back of the book mm -hmm. that had already been laid out mm -hmm. and it might and it, you would see it, its position uh in the magazine and, the, and the, there's probably about 70 78 pages or 80 pages would be a typical magazine mm -hmm. uh, in, in length. Um, but U.S. News would sell ads uh, against you know, certain stories. And so these regionals, so as the magazine started to go together, you would see these spreads and then there would be a little flag um, that would be up there uh, between the, the, the two sides of the spread and it would be a regional. Mm -hmm. And you, you would know that even though you, you, this was a nice layout, that when it, when it actually came out on the press, there would be something in the middle there, mm -hmm. there would be an ad. Now, so that, uh, regional, just to, just to find the term, uh, what does it mean for U.S. News? What, what well, kind of, how many regions? Well, what they could do is they can um, put ads in according to zip code. Mm -hmm. uh, so people, you know, depending on, you know, obviously the demographics of the zip code are important to the mm -hmm. advertiser. Mm -hmm. So um, you can put ads that are regionalized mm -hmm. in there, and so you can sell those ads. Um, and it's very competitive because a, especially when uh, a magazine, uh, an issue, has one of the very well thought of guides, mm -hmm. you know, like a, you know, a money guide or a, uh, the, the college, the college book, right. book. That Those are very hot uh, issues mm -hmm. to get. Because at, uh, at the same time that magazine comes out, uh, the full guide comes out on the newsstand. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, like a, um, uh, a, a smaller version of the, the full book. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, so th at that point, you know, th in advance, the people in New York, the advertising people in New York will be selling the ads against those pages. Mm -hmm. 
and that's where they get their you know their top dollar because uh, the advertisers know that that people will uh, buy that magazine off the newsstand and that the people who subscribe are going to be looking at those sections you know so it's it makes those those sections you know more valuable so with a magazine the the uh, if i'm an advertiser i can i i'm selling bmws or something i can select uh, certain zip code. I mean, it would be a block you, of zip codes, right? Right, uh, right. You could say there's no reason for me to, you know, sell, you know, p run an ad in this particular part of the magazine. Mm -hmm. You know, you could so they'll and they print that up. That all, you know, the, it's all programmable into right. the, you know, and they and they and those things get mailed out. That's what's kind of interesting about the, also the, how the computer, you know, runs that part of the the publishing business, is that, you know, that goes in one end of the of the printing pr plan and comes out. The other end, boxed up and ready to be mailed, right? You know, according to the demographics, yeah. Which is an incredible marketing tool. One of the you things, know, you know, uh, to totally automated. <laughs> well, yeah. One of the things uh, we learned uh, in an earlier segment was about versioning, uh, and um, I think if you go to a big printer like Donnelly, they they can create uh, thousands of different versions of, of a magazine just any way you want it, and uh, it's as, as you say, it's all automated, all computer controlled. Mm -hmm. So what uh, what prompted U.S. News to, to get interested in alternative delivery, and, and I mean, when did that start to happen? Well, not too long after I um, got to the magazine, um, they their first interest was in CompuServe, mm -hmm. and um, I that was something that was you know a, a deal that was negotiated between you know CompuServe and, and U.S. News, mm -hmm. and uh, then we developed. Uh, some of the interface, you know, for that, we some icons. It wasn't as as icon driven, for instance, uh, or a graphical interface as uh, the web is. Mm -hmm. But that was incredibly popular, and it had a lot of live forums. We did live things where, uh, you know, people would come actually to U.S. News, and we'd have a, a room with a bunch of uh, computers, and you could have these live conferences with people, ask them questions. This was U.S. News delivered by CompuServe? Right. You could get the full text of the magazine okay. on CompuServe. You could get some photographs, uh, not very many. Um, and the other thing was the, the big selling point for this was uh, the forum. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, there were both live forums, and they were advertised on CompuServe, uh, where you, you would have an opportunity to you know, pose questions to well-known newsmakers. And then there were these uh, other um, not live forums that uh, e different editors of the magazine or writers of the magazine uh, moderated. Mm -hmm. And uh, those were incredibly busy, mm -hmm. uh, an awful lot of traffic. And uh, um, of course, then, then we left CompuServe. Um, Just uh, before you leave CompuServe, did people pay a, a, a premium? A, there was, at, well, there was different levels. There uh -huh. was, at, at some point, um, there was something you could you could get entirely for free, and that would be part of your CompuServe mm -hmm. um, subscription rate. But there were some of the archives, other things that that was a premium, mm -hmm. and you paid for that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was you know it it, it proved to be um, I mean it was um, pretty incredible. I mean the, the 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 amount of people that that came and looked at the magazine on CompuServe. Um, I don't know that it made anybody any money. Uh, I I'm not. I wasn't that familiar with, uh, you know, like the corporate aspects of mm -hmm. it and who was paying who what in order mm -hmm. to do this. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it certainly, in, as far as raising the magazine's profile, was was quite helpful. And that I mean that's an important part of uh, the publication. Mm -hmm. now, the thing is that it, uh, at that point, uh, CompuServe had uh, had not replaced you know the magazine. Um, and it certainly wasn't selling advertising. Now, there were some commercial offerings uh, that were related to the CompuServe site, mm -hmm. but nothing like the, what's done now on the web with banner ads and things like that. So the, the, the editorial um, content of the magazine was, was that text content, at least, was taken and it was converted into, into formats that were compatible with CompuServe. Yes, there was an upload procedure. I mean, the um, uh, U.S. News uses um, a, a, a text system called ATEX, mm -hmm. and that they was still use the ATEX yeah, system. Yeah, and that was all exportable, you know. Out, mm -hmm. you know, there was a little bit of a, a translation effort in order to get it out to CompuServe. Mm -hmm. But then there was a you know, we we had an avenue uh, to, Compus, to CompuServe and how the pages were uploaded to, mm -hmm. to CompuServe. 
And uh, I mean, the magazine was entirely responsible for you know maintaining that. Uh, the company sort of mm -hmm. didn't uh, you know do that. Right. There was someone at the magazine that was responsible for doing that upload every week. And so it was a weekly thing. It was this, it yes. was once you closed the magazine, you uploaded yeah. the electronic, and then the other stuff went down to, through the normal channels. And so right. there was a correspondence. I mean, they, they were identical content that right. was appearing <clears throat> on CopyServe. Right, right. At that point, they, um, other than the, the um, um, forums, there was no effort to uh, create separate content mm -hmm. uh, for CompuServe. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was, so it was just the stories, mm -hmm. the, the text version of the magazine that was put up there. We did a, a, <clears throat> I did a couple uh, PDF projects um, for uh, CompuServe. Uh, they were uh, very heavy photo-based things. Mm -hmm. um, one of our staff photographers, Brian Palmer, who's now the correspondent in China for the magazine, um, did a story about a, a, a young boy who had brain surgery, and it was a cover story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I converted that to PDF and put that on CompuServe for people to download. And it was one of those, it wasn't exactly like the magazine, um, but it was, it was close, the layout was close. Mm -hmm. What I did was I, I took the Quark uh, Express layouts and modified them um, so they, they looked better uh, on, a as, screen. on a screen or if somebody printed it out, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, take those into consideration, you know, just kind of redesigned it a little bit. And we did, a, I did a couple of those, but that was, I mean, those were fairly um, awkward in a way, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, it would, took a long time for people to download. And, mm -hmm. and people still at that point were complaining about uh, graphics, mm -hmm. like on CompuServe, and having to download something you know, with pictures. So it wasn't it wasn't like the web at that point. So um, when 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 you access the, the the magazine on CompuServe to begin with, you got this week's version of it. Did, it was did they start? Too. Was, no, they yeah. so they archived it. Yeah. So that was the, the first time you could, you, you could start to gain the benefit of, of, of going back through the archives and um, electronically. Yes, right. Not right. even to keep this, the old magazine sitting in the corner. Yeah, it wasn't um, the, um, actually the web version is, is much uh, better archived and linked uh, than CompuServe was. Um, the, one of the, the, I mean, you know, part of now is the research is because you're uh, taking a publication and um, uh, putting it online is the added responsibility of uh, linking outside of that that, mm -hmm. that information. Mm -hmm. uh, people never did that in a magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, there was I mean, there was no resource really. I mean, the magazine is a static thing. Well, there was an, there was, there was an 800 number in the ad. Yeah, I mean, you, you yeah. could sort of look at that as a somehow some kind of link. Right, right. But uh, beyond that, you know, you if you read a story, you were pretty much stuck uh, with that story. If you wanted to right. find out uh, anything more about it, you would have had to go to the library and look up in the reader's guide or something like that the, the subject matter and uh, uh, do something you know, that kind of research. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now what happens is that the staff actually does the research in advance and hypertext links those things to. Mm -hmm what they believe to be, uh, you know, appropriate information. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of, um, you know, bad information on the web. And so the, there is a, an added responsibility now if you're going to send people outside of your own publication, electronic version, you know, to make sure that where you send them is, is reliable. So the, the whole, the whole, of course, then they go someplace else and then they get sent someplace and, you Get know, back. And they don't have to get them back. It, it, well, that, uh, that was, a, I remember, um, an early <clears throat> uh, concern was, um, well, what do we do if we send someone to another page mm -hmm. uh, on somebody else's site? You know, will they come back? Right. Um, there are ways that you can prevent them from actually leaving your site. You can d design an HTML page now where it, that, that other link opens up in a separate window, and, their, and right. your window never goes away. Right. And that's one way of reminding people from whence they came, yeah. you know, but um, that I mean that is a you know a concern because uh, you don't want to lose those, that audience. Yeah, I've heard about uh, uh, people uh, who frame other people's sites. For example, Frank Cost's uh, website uh, could could frame U.S. News and World Report and make it appear as though U.S. News was uh, was my presentation. Um, I I knew of a, a few instances where uh, people had done. Um, 
similar kinds of things, and that they had been contacted by the lawyers at the magazine, you know, to not to do that, um, or using you know other you know some some part of the content uh, in some fashion on their website. Um, and I don't know that it, I don't remember in any of those cases that it ever went beyond. Uh, a friendly letter from the lawyer. A friendly lawyer letter. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, and I, the thing, of course, the thing about the web is that it's so large um, that finding, you know, any any instance of that mm -hmm. uh, could be more than a full time job. Mm -hmm. um, generally, sometimes how it happens is that somebody else sees it in in their surfing, and uh, you know, maybe somebody working at the magazine or a friend of somebody at the magazine. Mm -hmm. and, or a publication, and they might call you up or send you an email message and say, "Gee, I, you know, I just saw your story someplace." Right. And it, you know, I, you know, the thing is that um, because the technology has moved so fast, I mean, there was a lot of, uh, of traditional values in the publishing industry about copyright and about plagiarism, things like that, that have evolved over what the printing press has been around for 500 years. Right. And and so the people that had control over that technology were pretty limited number mm -hmm. uh, and compared to the people that uh, have control or access to the web. Mm -hmm. And so what ha I think what's happened is that you have people that either aren't aware, uh, either through because of education or just whatever, um, they just, in a lot of cases, just naively do things mm -hmm. like that and they don't understand that uh, that hasn't been a, a, an accepted practice. Right. And that maybe you should ask before you do that. Well, there's a degree of defiance, too, on some people are openly contemptuous of these kind of intellectual property. Yeah, well, a lot of that came initially from the, the very beginning of the web, mm -hmm. uh, before it became a, a, a fairly mainstream thing. It's kind of interesting is, is that the, the people that were the practitioners of that were mostly academics. Mm -hmm. and, and you would think that those people would have been <clears throat> more interesting and interested in uh, guarding intellectual property mm -hmm. than, than um, someone who was uh, not connected with that discipline. Um, I, I just, it, it, it probably what it seems is that, you know, it's electronic and it, it, it really doesn't exist mm -hmm. in, in some way. And, and, and so, you know, how can you, um, you know, protect can, it? Right. I mean, it, it's, it's very much like, um, uh, a, a, someone said that the, the web is very much like uh, the oral uh, tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has a lot of that. And, it, and it, 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 in the end, it, it may define uh, or redefine uh, concepts about uh, intellectual property. Uh, uh, and certainly, in the in postmodern art, there's been a lot of appropriation of other images mm -hmm. and things and incorporating them in, and it's 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 a tradition that's been around you know yeah. for a while. So, I, uh, when we talk about the web, uh, you were you started there in 1993. Uh, was the web at that point? It wasn't hardly well, even Mosaic, known. I had seen, of course, having come from RIT and in an academic uh, world, there was a greater awareness of of the web. Mm -hmm. I remember I had a a web server software on my Mac here at RIT, and we were kind of playing with things like that internally and uh, at the Mac, at the at the school. But when I went to U.S. News in '93, um, by and large, most of the staff had not heard of the web, mm -hmm. and there was only a few people had email. And most of that email was something they did on their own. was wasn't something that U.S. News supported. Mm -hmm. They either had through CompuServe or America Online or or, or you know some other service, and. Um, and so it, it was interesting in that four years that I was at the magazine, uh, you could see this this change uh, from nobody having email to everybody having access to it mm -hmm. and everybody having computers and and people using the web and using the web for research. Um, it just it, it was a, a a very big change in the dynamic of the of the magazine. So be, it, when I first got to the magazine, I'd be talking about it. Um, you know, the uh, people were unaware of it. Mm -hmm and to where it was part of everyday conversation when right. I left. You know, so it's so what, when, did the, when did they first start thinking about getting the actual content, the editorial content, uh, to the web? I mean, they, they went to CompuServe first. But well, about it was when after, it was um, when, they, when it became apparent that uh, U.S. News uh, would no longer have a contract with CompuServe, um, then I, I think the idea of, of going to the web became uh, a real uh, interesting concept to the magazine uh, because they they realized that they I mean er, at that point things were still uh, nebulous about who was going to be looking at the web 
and uh, whether it was going to be worthwhile. But it was, it was like everybody else was doing it, mm -hmm. and so we better we better do it too. Because mm -hmm. everybody else being your 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 competitors' time. Yes. Yeah. Although um, we actually were on the web before uh, Newsweek, mm -hmm. and I, and Time might have been around the same time. They were on you know, through uh, Pathfinder, uh, which is a Time Warner. Uh, you know, thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it, <clears throat> you know, it was it was it was one of those things where uh, when we decided to do it, um, there was a, an enormous amount of effort went into it. Uh, originally, there was a, an opportunity to do something with Microsoft, mm -hmm. and there was a, a a demonstration done for Microsoft, a design uh, for their their network, which never at that point didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, that was later reborn again. Microsoft tried it again. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but that wasn't, I don't think that, that original one wasn't going to be a web thing. It was, mm -hmm. more, it was going to be more uh, along a the model of, of, of right. you know, CompuServe or America Online. And um, when, but it became apparent that it was, you know, to, I think, to a lot of people's advantage, you know, or the, the magazine's advantage, that, uh, that the web was going to be a more interesting, you know, place to be, that you didn't need <clears throat> uh, Microsoft mm -hmm. or anybody else really to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's one of the interesting things about the technology is that um, uh, you can be a very small house and look just as good as you know General Motors or anybody else. Yeah. You know, it, and that's that's an interesting kind of playing field to be on. Um, and it and so the when we took I, basically what we did the, the design work we'd done for the Microsoft uh, project uh, was modified for the web, mm -hmm. and and it kind of evolved through that. Uh, and uh, and the whole, I mean, the the other thing is 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 process. I mean, this whole idea of of, of publishing on the web uh, and how did that fit into the uh, the responsibility of doing a magazine? Mm -hmm. you know, where do you find the staff to do it? Uh, in most cases, people were doing double duty, you know, doing both you know print jobs and web jobs. And there were things, there were issues came up uh, in the in, in the production, for instance. Uh, uh, about using photographs, uh, you know, if, if, should they be on the web before they went in the magazine? You know, like if it was a news story, and if we were going to run a uh, a, a story in the magazine, it right. would be out in the newsstands on Monday, but on Wednesday we had the pictures. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, could we put those on the web? On you know, a week could we scoop ourselves? Uh huh. You know, things like could, that. Could you? We, we did. We had some interesting you know conversations about that. I remember one of the. An interesting thing we did an interview with uh, Clinton, um, and um, <clears throat> it was uh, kind of late in the week. And one of the things I did was I edited audio. Uh -huh. I, I would do these interviews, and I would edit audio to, for real audio. Well, traditionally in the magazine, you, you, you uh, in, in print, you 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 do an, an interview, but it's not really verbatim. Right. People don't necessarily talk in complete sentences. Right. And and so you kind of fix what people say. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and so we had done this interview, and they wanted to put it on the web uh, with Clinton. And it was also going into a sidebar in the magazine. Mm -hmm. And so I, I saw the proofs. And it was like, this is like Friday afternoon. This interview had happened late in the week. And I'm reading that, and I'd already done the edits for the, um, um, uh, the audio. So I, I said, well, they're not the same. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not that they, they were different, but they, but you might be able to have drawn a conclusion that somewhere along the line we were putting words in Clinton's mouth, uh -huh. or, or because they, because this had never happened before. So w went to the editors and we sat down and we talked about. It. I said, well, what, you know, what can we do? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, here's some, here's what the audio sounds like. This is what it really uh -huh. said. And here's the sidebar in the magazine. Yeah. They're, they're a little, they're, the content's basically the same, but it's not word for word. Right. And it, and and so there. It's probably not something that Clinton would even be upset about. It's just the pers the the difference there is is right. When I saw that, I thought, well, there's here's a chance, you know, for some misunderstanding uh -huh. on the part of the, of the public as as to what this process is about. Mm -hmm. You know how you know how do you uh, do an interview and, and and how does it get in onto the printed page? Uh, and uh, so, the, I mean, those are issues that had never come up before mm -hmm. uh, because that that had never that was never revealed. Right. Right. You know? And uh, so it's interesting, like, it, 
part of it is, 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 is this, as this technology unfolded and the magazine is, began to employ it, um, there were all sorts of choices like this that kind of came up because nobody thought about them in advance because mm -hmm. it was all happening too quickly. Right. And, and it's, I mean, that's one of the interesting things about the technology is that it's being invented as you're using it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, you know, like every few weeks there's, you know, some new nuance that you can incorporate because somebody's added some feature to the technology. And, and that causes, you know, in some case, ethical problems. You know, there's, there's all sorts of things that can, you know, come up that you, and you can't, and, there's, and because it changes so quickly and easily, uh, in some ways you can't really prepare yourself uh, except to, to keep your eyes open mm -hmm. and, and, and be very careful about what you're doing. It's very, in, in a sense, it's very much like live television. Live television has the a distinct disadvantage of, of being sometimes absolutely terrible. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially news reporting, mm -hmm. uh, because people, uh, it's it's very hard to have uh, an event unfold in front of you, and to be able at the same time, you know, describe it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's one thing to do a you know like a baseball game or something like right. that where it's you know, merely entertaining, but you know to to do this in a in a live situation that on television is very difficult. So now all of a sudden, uh, print journalism is entering into the territory mm -hmm. of of TV. And I remember I was out with a video camera shooting in, in, you know, in, in, in Washington. I was doing this thing at the Justice uh, Building. And I was lined up with all the TV people with my video camera on the tripod. And somebody looked down at my credentials. And it, this is like US News and World Report. And this guy from NBC looks at me, he said, looked at me, looked at the camera, looked uh -huh. at my credentials. Uh -huh. you know, and he says, what are you doing? And I said, <laughs> I said, we, I said we're, gonna, we're doing the same thing. We can put video on the web now. Uh -huh. I said, we're going to, you know, we're after you. Yeah. You know, he looked at me really funny. Yeah. And because it, it is, it's kind of all of a sudden this mix where there, you know, you, you can do video, you can do audio, have, you can read it, you can print it out, you know, you can do all this stuff. Yeah. All of a sudden in, in one presentation that means. And, and so that's, that's really interesting, that part of it. It, se it seems to me that, that um, I was uh, looking at a couple of news magazine sites. U.S. News is, is one, to, uh, but Time has something now called Time Daily. Which and, and and the question it begs the question: What's the difference between Time Daily and the New York Times on the web? I mean, are these things well, coming together? Well, we did. I mean, we did uh, breaking news. There's a breaking news section of the magazine, and uh, so you could go to that. Mm -hmm. And it depending on what it was. Sometimes there were stories that were written by staff. If if the story was uh, important enough, a lot of it was from the wires. Mm -hmm. The photographs might be from the wires. Because um, all, all that, that that media came into us electronically, uh, uh, a, AP photographs, AP stories, Reuters photographs, Reuters stories, mm -hmm. Agence France Press, uh, their photographs. So th that was all you know, you know, put into the mix. So you that was available to us on a daily basis mm -hmm. if we wanted to use that material on the web, and we did. Uh, if there was a breaking story, so so that that was one thing you could do is you could kind of do a daily mm -hmm. you know presentation. Um, and uh, there was a group of people that, that did just that as well as the, and then we also did special things for the web that didn't appear in the magazine mm -hmm. or extensions of a story uh, in the, uh, uh, on the web. Uh, I did a lot of audio uh, uh, for stories that were, uh, in, appeared in, as print in mm -hmm. the magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, that was an, an extra component that, and I went to the conventions and did audio and pictures and then the, that was put into the, uh, onto the web page, and those are things that you so you could have daily reports uh, in that way. You could produce things. So the the uh, the veteran news photographer becomes a uh, an audio uh, editor, uh, putting audio clips up on the right. on the web, uh, and 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 almost all other uh, any other kind of information that you that you that's compatible with this you. You become involved with because you have to. Yes, and that's an interesting problem uh, from an education standpoint. If you're if you're teaching someone to be a photojournalist or a, a photo editor or a writer, mm -hmm. uh, you know where are the boundaries now as far as th their potential responsibility yeah. in, in applying their craft? Because you know they may be doing a lot of different things. You know, all of a sudden, which is is good. And I think what it means is that if you're going to be a photographer in this business now that you, you probably ought to be much better educated, mm -hmm. at least outside the boundaries of photography, in order to uh, actually survive and produce you know, viable material, mm -hmm. because you're going to be called upon, I think, uh, if, in the course of your career, if you're young and getting into this business now, 
that, that it's going to be a lot different. You just won't be a, someone out there with a, you know, a camera right. taking pictures. Right. Well, we're, we're, we're running out of time here. I, I think the way I'd like to end this is to, is to talk a little bit about the, the, the future of this, of this medium. Uh, right now, I can get to U.S. News on the web, and it's a free service. Um, what, what's going to happen there? Is, is it going to remain free? Uh, well, am I going to pay for it someday? Well, if you notice, there's advertising there now. There's, there's advertising there's, there. You know, click-through banner ads. Um, that's, uh, I, don't think, I don't think that you're going to pay for it uh, directly. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there may be special things that could be uh, offered, but th there wasn't any, I don't think it was any, I can't remember any serious c consideration of wanting to charge people for it. Uh, I think they were hoping that the, the, the advertising would, I mean, the thing is that, I mean, the magazine is still the, the, the main venue, mm -hmm. the, printed, the printed one, mm -hmm. and that the electronic version is, still plays in a, in a large sense second fiddle. Mm -hmm. Although the, the advertising revenue, they, uh, advertising, uh, advertisers have, you know, discovered the web and mm -hmm. realized that it, it, it can be a, a useful, you know, medium. And, I, you know, it seems to me that as the, this thing progresses and people, you know, you know utilize it more and more that you'll you'll see more of a migration away from certainly it's cheaper to you know put something on the web than, mm -hmm. than to uh, you know print it yeah and uh, it's just a matter of delivery I mean if, if if you can reach your subscribers you know electronically as easily I mean if, if they have the, the, the connection to, to do it well it, it may happen mm -hmm. that people would uh, you know see US news or whatever um, on a computer screen screen instead of uh, getting it uh, in the mailbox or on a newsstand. Right. Only time will tell. I th you know, it's obviously, um, there's an enormous inertia here. And, um, you know, we're kind of like riding on a wave. I That's think. right. In five years, uh, so much has happened. Who knows what's going to happen in the next five years? Right. From, like, nobody knowing about it. Uh, I mean, it was just a couple years ago, they were writing the web off. They were saying that it wouldn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. It was, it was going to go downhill. And, and right. It certainly hasn't happened. I, mean, I think there was, uh, I can't remember, there was some, the number of web pages, I think, when I left RIT to, to go to U.S. News was, uh, that was infinitesimal. Uh -huh. And in, in a few months, it was like 50,000. It's just, it's just. Right. Well, Keith, I'd like to thank you very much for, for coming here and sharing your uh, experiences with us. Uh, I'm sure the uh, students uh, have a new insight into what this uh, news magazine publishing business is all about. Um, and uh, we hope to uh, talk to you again sometime. Okay, thank you.